Okay, today we are Tuesday, April 16th. We are at the East Ridge Rec Center in Highlands Ranch, right. Colorado, about right. to get mm -hmm. some thoughts from an early executive with Mission Viejo here named Joe Blake. So Joe, thank you for coming and sharing some thank thoughts you about your earliest memories in the almost 20 years that you worked for Yes. Mission Viejo, who eventually then became Shea Holmes. Right. You have many aspects of your education and career before that, right. and many things that you've done after that right. as well. And so we'll just touch on those just briefly, but right. the focus of this today, we'll talking about your time here in Highlands Ranch and what roles you played to right. get this lovely community uh, developed uh, from right. an infrastructure point of view and anything else you'd like to tell us. Great. So for the record, tell us your name, where you were born and when. Uh, Joe Blake, and I was born in Denver, Colorado on Christmas Eve, 1935. And so a Denver native and grew up in, uh, in, the, in the neighborhood of Park Hill over by the Museum of Nature and Science in, in Denver and still live in Park Hill. You so. live in Park Hill or Montview? Uh, I actually live on 17th Avenue Parkway, uh, which is just south of Montview Boulevard. You're familiar with okay, that. I right? am. Good. Got it. Yeah. Got it. That point. You went to high school at East? I went to high school at East, uh, which was then and now a, a great high school, an iconic building and a wonderful place. I just had a grandson graduate from there a, a year ago now mm -hmm. and then wonderful. off off to Dartmouth College. And, and that then, is, that's one of Joe's sons? That's what, that's my daughter's son. Your daughter's son. Da Don, mm -hmm. Daughter Ann Patterson. Yeah. Daughter and, and just, uh, I've got two grandsons, four grandsons, each of my, my boys. My boy, uh, Joe, has two boys, and my daughter Ann has two boys. And okay. so we're very pleased about that. Wonderful. You went to Dartmouth for undergraduate. How did. did you pick that? Why did you go to Dartmouth? Uh, at that time, there were a number of, of East High people that were going. It was an all-male school at that time. Uh, it was a great place. I had a great four years there and thoroughly enjoyed my time. Um, and then came back. And by the way, it still has a great alumni base here in uh, in Colorado and a great a great regard for uh, for its history and traditions. Then I came back here to law school, University of Colorado. Uh, I did not take a gap year uh, between uh, graduating from high school. I graduated in 1954 from high school and then East, uh, after East, went to Dartmouth and graduated in 1958 and then graduated from law school in 61. And that was in <clears throat> Boulder? Yes. Yep, at that time. <clears throat> Good. So at that point, what did you do with your newly acquired law degree? Well, it was uh, in, a, in a, a, a kind of a crazed moment. I, I uh, had taken the bar, and a lot of my colleagues were going to wait for six months or better to find out the results of the bar exam. And I thought, well, you know, rather than wait around, I think what I'm going to do is something rather adventuresome. <clears throat> and so I went down and applied uh, to be a special agent in the FBI, which which was remarkable because I replied sometime in late June, early July, and I found myself in the new agents class in September of uh, the same year. I mean, they, they did a very poor job of uh, background investigation by, by choosing to take, take me in. But I had three and a half years in the Bureau and loved every minute, loved where, every minute. Where were you working at that time? <clears throat> I worked, uh, started out in Tampa, then over to St. Pete. Then I, I went up to uh, New York City uh, for, for six months. And then I had a, a great experience. They were sending agents to learn various foreign languages. And I was sent out at a hazard duty to, uh, to Monterey, California, to the well, that's Army Language School to learn French, mm -hmm. <clears throat> which was unbelievable. I can still remember sitting up on those wonderful hillsides overlooking the Pacific, listening to the seals barking and trying to memorize my French dialogues for the ensuing day. Then I, then I was transferred back to Washington, D.C. and 
64, and that's where I met uh, this beautiful, beautiful, wonderful young lady from South Carolina who was working for Strom Thurmond. And Elizabeth. Elizabeth. Mm-hmm. And uh, we met uh, in May of 1964, and uh, I courted all over the battlefields of Virginia, primarily some in Maryland. I knew nothing about the Civil War, but I thought if I could get her out into the countryside, uh, that that would be a better chance than what she was being courted heavily by the guy. She worked up on the hill, and so you can imagine. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then we were engaged in August and married on on Halloween uh, of 1964. A scary thought. (laughs) Very good. Yes, indeed. Very true. At that point, did you... Then I came back. I practiced. I came. I came back to Denver. Practiced for a while, and then I had a, a, a great experience. I was uh, appointed as a legislative assistant for then Senator Gordon Allett. Uh, mm-hmm. Senator Allett was from from the uh, Arkansas Valley, from Lamar. Uh, he had just been elected to his third term. A fabulous senator. A wonderful time to be in Washington from 1987 to. 1970, excuse me, 1967 to 1970. I mean, there was so much going on. Vietnam was going on. Uh, it, it, you, you were alive every single day. It was the most remarkable and, and fun thing. Both of our children, uh, Anne was born in 1967 in, at the Columbia Hospital for Women, and son Joe was born in 1968, 15 months apart uh, at, the same, at the same hospital. Then. Then uh, in, in 1970, I moved back here and went uh, with the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. It had just opened its office. The, the, uh, during the Johnson administration, uh, the Department of Housing and Urban Development had been authorized. And so they were starting to consolidate various activities, FHA, urban renewal, public housing, uh, under, under HUD. And I came back here as, as regional counsel and then became regional uh, uh, deputy regional administrator and acting uh, administrator and I had a fabulous time. We had six states, Wyoming, Colorado, the Dakotas, Utah, and Montana. So it was perfect. So how long did you work there? I worked there for about three, three and a half years. And then uh, the man who was general counsel for... Uh, for HUD, started a mortgage insurance company. And he asked me to come with him and start the office here, which I did for three or four years. And it was during that time uh, that, I, that I heard, you know, that, that Mission Viejo, which had been building this community in Aurora, Mission Viejo, Aurora, uh, had been looking at the possibility, and then, of course, did, uh, take an option on the Marvin Davis option about the acquisition of Highlands Ranch. I assume you knew Pat Farrell? Uh, I did. And, um, but the man that I knew uh, who brought me the, the opportunity to be with Mission Viejo was Jim R- Richardson, Nicholson, Jim Nicholson, who uh, was practicing law with the law firm that Mission Viejo was using to get its entitlement started, to get its planned unit development approved. And, and Jim called me and said, hey, Joe, they're looking for someone with a legal background, someone who's been familiar with, uh, with local government and, and uh, has, deals with the legislature. And also, they'd like to have someone who's kind of a local boy who can help uh, guide them around on some of the local issues here. So this was 78, 79. This was 1979, and um, had they had the development plan approved yet? No, they were still going through that. They were they were just finishing up. They had, as I recall, they had taken this option on Highlands Ranch in uh, in 19 uh, 1978. Uh, with the understanding that they had, would have two years within which to get the planned unit development approved and through the county. So they brought a fabulous team of, of individuals from California to work on that with a fabulous group in Douglas County, well 
common sense. They, the, the, the leadership, the county commissioners, planning commission, fabulous people who are dealing with something quite complex, quite new, and they applied enormous common sense to it. And the Mission Viejo people were so extraordinarily ethical in everything that they did. <clears throat> every, every, every promise that was made was put in writing. It was, it was agreed that everything that they said they were going to do, they would do and review it annually with the county commissioners. I mean, the, the trust factor and the good faith factor were, were, were hallmarks of the best that there is in, in, in development. So I, um, I heard from Phil Riley, who was the president of, of uh, Mission Viejo Company in California. He had me come out to, uh, to California to meet with him. Then my wife and I came out, Elizabeth and I went out, and they offered the job, and it was unbelievable. I mean, the opportunity. But I have to say, um, I had no background, no, uh, no real expertise in any of the things that I was being called upon to do. I, I was, um, the, the title was uh, senior vice president for, just senior vice president, but under that, was all of the government relations, all of the legal. Um, we, we, uh, we had a legal team that we hired from the outside. Davis, Graham, and Stubbs was our law, law firm. And you George, were inside counsel? I was inside counsel. We hired one guy who was an inside counsel, ended up bringing Paul Pressman out here, at, ultimately, from Mission Viejo, California, to, to quarterback what was, what was going on. And then I was responsible for the finance uh, side of this, the, the issuances of bonds, the mortgages. So fortunately, the things I had done before were kind of preparation for what I was being called upon. But I have to say that uh, I was in awe of these people then and now who had come here from California, who had built Mission Viejo, California, uh, not only with Mission Viejo Company, but the Jack Robb, R-A-U-B Company. The engineering The people. engineering people. These, these were just highly skilled, qualified, ethical people. Jim Tepfer was brought out as the, as the Colorado president of that operation. And, and I uh, really, for the first, I bet for the first six months, uh, I was just on the steepest learning curve everybody, anybody could ever be. I, I remember I'd go, go home and say, Elizabeth, I, I never made a declarative statement today. Everything I did today was a question. Why, why do we do it this way? And how can I do this? And what about that? And where can I be of help on this? When did you start officially with Mission Viejo? Yes, I started officially in uh, January of, uh, of 19... Oh, 1980, and uh, stayed there with Mission until uh, and Mission at the time was owned by Philip Morris. And by the way, you couldn't have found a a finer parent to have than the people at at Philip Morris. They they were again uh, amazing individuals. Yes, they were in they were in the in in the cigarette side. They were in Millers. They had craft. They were, they had a mission, uh, Philip, Philip Morris uh, Credit Corporation, which helped us in, in so many areas of financing what was going on. And I have to say, uh, when, when this community was getting started, they, were, they got their approval in December of 1979 from Douglas County. So they started the, the hardscape construction. You know, you look at these roads, you, you, you Highlands Ranch Boulevard, all of those roads were built at capacity to begin with because these, these were real visionaries, the people who were doing this. Jim Tepper told me that the finance people convinced them that that would be economically more advantageous to build the roads at full capacity, yes. even though that capacity wouldn't be needed for several years. Yes. And, as part of the master development that, plan. That's right. And that master development plan that was done in 1979 is the essential same development that has occurred in the intervening time. Think about that. 1980, here we are, 2019. And, and it's the same essential plan. 
with lots of open space, lots of open space. It's amazing. But I was going to mention that that when we opened, um, we opened for sale. With the first homes opened, as I remember, in 1981. Summer of 81. Summer of 81. In December of 1980, in December of 1980, think about this. The prime rate topped out at 21.5%. 21 and a half percent. It's not been anywhere near that since that time. But it was slowly coming down when we began opening the groves and, and other, the, the first three uh, housing projects here. And at that time, the interest rate was somewhere in the neighborhood of 14 and a half percent. I saw some advertisements to that effect. Yes. And we were able to buy the rate down from 14 and a half to, so you started at 11 percent and then. 11 and a half, 12 and a half, 13, then it would go to 14. So it was, uh, the, the interest rate environment was very difficult here. At the time that we got underway, however, maybe after the first or second year of full production of what we were doing, 20%, 20% of all new homes sold in the metro area were being sold here at Highlands Ranch. It was remarkable. And Mission Viejo was the exclusive builder initially. It, it was the exclusive. They they had had that experience in in California. They did not want to, they did not want to uh, have other builders here. But over time, they recognized that that would be that would be appropriate to bring other builders in, and they they were very um, uh, careful with who they brought in because they we had a standard of expectation. You know, when, when you're talking about building a community that will not be completed for 25 years, you are making promises not just to you today, Mark, but you have to be sure that you can fulfill those promises to your grandchildren when they move here. So everything that's being done is being done with expectation of we've got to do it right. And unlike other developers, I think, um, Mission was very, very clear that it paid its share of uh, the, the assessments that needed to be paid to the HRCA, to anything else that was going on. We actually paid those. And when you, when you talk about uh, uh, setting those assessments, setting those uh, uh, mill rates, uh, those mill rates that were set in 1980, 1981, essentially are the same. Now, yes, they because property values have come up, but Bruce Lebsack and others, the financial people we had here, were extraordinary in, in terms of what they, could, uh, what they could foresee. So you had the, the, you had the community association, and we, we... You joined the board in 1981 and served for 10 years. I did serve for 10 years, and uh, I, I remember meeting with the first, the first uh, homeowners and saying, hey, we are going to be on board here. We're going to, we're going to just so you know, because we pay the majority of the association uh, assessments, we're going to be in control for a while until everything gets balanced out so that we can fulfill the promises we made. We don't want to lose control here and then have people say, well, we don't want to do it that way anymore. No. And, and it was a mandatory association. That's another thing that it, one of the reasons that this community association is responsible, as has been so responsible and has been so successful and has been so well thought out, is that it has a serious source of money that is mandatory, everybody, whether that's commercial or, or residential. So they could do that right. They could, everything was done right. And, and one of the things that was done here that you, you, you almost take for granted unless, unless you live outside of Highlands Ranch it, are these rec centers. These rec centers were built with, with uh, families in mind, with being sure that everybody has the opportunities to participate in athletics. In, I mean, this is a family. This has always been a family community. At, in, in the early days, if you, you would move here, I, I'd say this is the best place you could possibly live. If you were a single adult, that wasn't, you probably, unless you were a grandparent, you probably weren't going to be so happy here because we didn't have many apartments and we didn't have much going on. 
Not initially, but it was part of the development plan. But it was part of, of it. The higher, de the higher development that's, for higher density housing. That's exactly right. And then the commercial begins to come on. The employment base comes on. Um, we built our system so that everyone would be able to access. I mean, you've got a community now of almost 100,000 people. Gosh, when we started Highlands Ranch, I don't think there were 10,000 in Douglas County. I, I doubt it. So you had, you had stress on, on the schools. Um, here's, a, here's a growing uh, area with virtually no tax base. Um, so the, the first school that was built here, Northridge Elementary School, was based on the basis of uh, Mission Viejo Company put the money in to build it and it was reimbursed over time, over a long period of time. I think we gave them 10 years or 20 years to be reimbursed with the increased assessment of valuation. That's that, in addition to donating the land in that addition it was to, built on. Yes, sir. And in addition to paying the operating costs the first six months that Northridge opened. But it was in, the, it was in our best interest, and it was in the best interest of the school district. But it was the first of its kind that had, that had been done. But those stresses are always going to be a part. School district, uh, we had the great good fortune, I did, to work with Rick O'Connell as the superintendent. We became great friends. Here it is. Uh, did you go fly fishing with him? I did not go fly fishing, but we've spent a lot of time together. He and his wife, yeah. Mary Jane and I, this is the 17th, the 16th of, uh, of April uh, 2019. And I just had lunch with he and with, with him and his wife last week. So we all had to work very hard because the stresses were there. That, that what was we, your involvement with the first rec center, Northridge? Northridge, um, we, it was built, it was built not with handball courts at the time. I, I was an avid handball player, so that they were expanded. But that first rec center was important because it was at Northridge. And, and the park was there. One of the things that Mission had agreed in its list of things it was going to do was to provide a park for the community. So they put in, I believe, ultimately $2 million into the Northridge Park and then attached the rec center to it. So that that, that, that area around Broadway and C, what today C-470 um, is, is what that initial initial area. You bring up C-470, you, 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 it's a, that's a, it's an interesting and, and complex thing. There's a lot of construction going on out there right now. Initially, uh, that was to, be, to have been part of the interstate system. It was to have been a bypass around Denver to build so that people did not have to go through downtown Denver on Interstate 70. Ah, uh, but Dick Lamb. But then Dick Lamb, Governor Lamb said, ah, uh, we're going to... We're going to slow down that development. We're going to we're going to stop. We're going to put a silver spike in it. It's ironic because tonight I'm a, in a men's poetry class, and former Governor Lamb and I are in the same class. So I will tell him of our discussion today. One thing I find ironic is that we've seen pictures that Jim Teffer had. Yes. Of, uh, the grand party after the filming of Centennial in September of 1978. Yes. And who's in one of those pictures? Dick Lamb. Is that right? That's very interesting. Yeah. That's very interesting. Because uh, uh, we did an interview um, last year with Kathy Brock. Oh yes, who was the PR lady that yes was trying to keep Mission out of the papers. Yes. at this point, this yeah. was seventy eight. Yes, the whole thing on uh, the filming of Centennial was perceived as being a disruptor because their main focus was on completing the development plan, getting the approvals. But finally, Universal Studios, whatever, yes. convinced yes. them that it would be to their advantage if they allowed this to occur. And her deal was to say, OK, we'll let 30 people come in and view the filming and have lunch or breakfast with the, the crew and the stars. Right. And a grand party at the end. Uh, where they would invite um, the people that were important that Mission Viejo needed to meet 
yes. in the Denver area to be not just a California developer, but yes. a community person who was interested in being in the community long term. Right. Did you attend that party? I did not attend that. I joined them after that that uh, filming was, but when I joined them, they were they were still sort of cleaning up after it. And you know, uh, the Veniford Ranch Road gets its name because they put the sign over the front of the of the mansion, Veniford Ranch, because Absolutely. that was the that was the title in the in the book in Centennial, mm -hmm. and uh, it was great. I wanted to mention something about C four seventy. So so when it was when it, when Governor Lamb approved it, uh, it was going to be a parkway, and it was going to have a bike path along the side of it. But it's going to be called the Centennial Freeway. The Centennial Freeway. So, uh, in a when you have an interstate go through, the the, the federal government pays ninety percent, the state ten. But in this situation, it's now eighty five fifteen. So. One of the early things we did, we built a delegation, including Littleton, including others further west, the elected officials, and would annually go back to meet with our Washington representatives to say, we need to have C-470 funded. That was a big deal, was to get that finally completed. They actually, after a while, they needed to start taking money away from the planned expansion of of Santa Fe in order to build this with the priority that it was built. Weren't there some discussions with Littleton, shall we say, with different mm -hmm. points of view about the configuration of the Broadway uh, interchange? There was uh, Littleton appropriately, and and I uh, had a, lots and lots and lots of friends in Littleton and knew the. The mayor knew the, the the city councilman knew that the city manager appropriately. They're they're concerned about this development uh, that's that's going to take place on a on a ranch that's twenty two thousand acres and going to. Uh, at, at, I remember uh, seeing pictures of uh, kind of a noose uh, at the at the at the gate of, uh, at Broadway and. Uh, and what is now C four set well Broadway and County Line, so there was there was a lot of there was a lot of tension, and 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 appropriately so you're going to be building a lot of traffic on Broadway because people are going to be coming out that way, um, but we worked together on a lot of different things. Did you have personal involvement in that? I don't be modest. No, I well, I did because you know we needed to work things out. We just. We needed to make them work. And I'm told that that's your skill in getting groups that might have conflicting thank points you. of view well, I, in finding a middle ground. I thank you. I, I thank you. I enjoy doing that. Um, I, I uh, it's something that w when you when you can see the benefits for everybody, and you can get everybody to say, okay, let's let's see if we can't get this done. Um, when we when we were going to build uh, Centennial Water and Sanitation District, and I chaired that also for all those years, um, not related to Centennial, the the, the city. Actually, now. that was called Mission <clears throat> Viejo Water it, and Sanitation, it, and eventually they changed the name. Very good. You're absolutely right. They didn't want to get the developer's name involved there. So, by the way, we set up separate. Uh, uh, metro districts. We had five metro districts, and we had uh, service districts for the water and sanitation district, and a and a master district called Centennial Water and Sand. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> when we uh, at, at McClellan, uh, what was old McClellan, what is owned by Englewood. Uh, Englewood. We we worked on on that, getting uh, long term, long term. 20-year leases almost in perpetuity. You can't do it in perpetuity because of, of the law. But then we also, we worked, it was funny, Kiewit was building, uh, they had a, uh, a, a plant over where the South Platte River, where the South Platte Reservoir is today. And I remember we, we talked to them and said, hey, uh, you're going to be getting out of there one day and we would like to, build a reservoir there. This is Centennial Water and Sanitation District. And 
construction companies are wonderful. Kiewit's a good company. This to, is what became the uh, South, South Platte Reservoir. Reservoir. Yes. Yeah. And we said, uh, well, wouldn't you like to work? No, we don't want to work with you. So we said, all right, we'll, I'll tell you, we don't want to do this, but we'll do it this way. We'll condemn you. And then they said, well, why don't we work together? That's a good idea. Let's work together. So that is a great story. And by the way, um, I think that was completed in 2007. And, and I was fortunate to come back out and ask to speak uh, at that. And I pointed out, I, as I remember, I'm doing this from a, it's about 4,500 acre feet of storage in there. And it's all based on runoff. I mean, it, it, it's a it's all, sur it's all surface. Yeah it's, yeah, it's right. I mean, it's, it's a, it's, it did not have a priority going into it. We had to get a lot of ditch rights uh, to, in order to get that water uh, there. It's been an enormous success, enormous success, enormously expensive because the water goes under the Platte River, goes under Broadway goes up into McClellan, and then under C four seventy and into the into your my water plant. my water treatment plant. the one named after you after me. So, uh, but I I bring that up because it was at that point probably the only successful water project storage project of its type that had been built in the previous forty years. When you think about it, because you just don't get those things done. I mean, they're very difficult. And by the way, I loved water. I, the whole issue of water, we had John Hendrick here. We had a fabulous board of Centennial. Fabulous. Terry Krasiznik. I mean, these, these were people that were just, they were brilliant. They were, Later on, Rick McClough. Yes, Rick McClough. In 86 started. Yes. And he had uh, very nice things to say about you oh, and the, your involvement thank you. in making these things work smoothly. Well, it was it was fantastic. And uh, you, you learn so much. Um, you know, we have these four aquifers underneath us. Um, and and early on, early on, this is the kind of long range, serious investment that was made. Early on, we said, let's do aquifer storage and recovery. So we could inject into the into the, back into the aquifer when they were not being used, we were using surface water, and then take it out when we were not able. So we have the, probably the most extensive conjunctive use water program here at Highlands Ranch. I would, I would put it up against anyone in the country. Over three or four different layers. That's correct. Laramie, <clears throat> that's right. Denver, Dawson, Laramie, Fox Hills, yeah, yeah and Arapahoe. Yeah. So those are the those were the fun things. Those were the fun things. Um, and your involvement was primarily from a legal point of view. Well, it was from a legal point of view. I together also, that had conflicts that needed to be resolved. Yes, and and the the, the bond issuances early on, uh, the mortgages that were being mm -hmm. made. My responsibility was to get forward commitments so that when we opened. We could offer, in fact, a fourteen and a half percent buy down, um, and, and and because of my time in the mortgage insurance business, I knew the people in the industry, so I could go out and use use those contacts. But it was funny because <clears throat> I'm going to say on C470 again one more time. Um, so in in California, and there, you know there was always a little it, within the company, Mission Viejo Company, always a little. Well, we kind of do it better in California than. You know what's going on in Colorado, Joe. So in, even though Colorado <clears throat> was twice the size of the original Mission Viejo development, correct. But they they had done or Alyssa, Alyssa Viejo and all the other you're ones. Very good. About. You're very. In fact, they did Aliso Viejo the same time they they acquired Islands Ranch. But what they had in California on Interstate Five <clears throat> were five signs that said "Next Turn Mission Viejo," and they said, Joe. You get us signs. We want signs <clears throat> on C470 mm -hmm. that say Highlands Ranch next three X. So I worked with the highway department. That we can't. We, we'll do it, Joe. We'll do it if you guys will incorporate because we don't do it to uh, mm -hmm. deal with the development. We're just not going to do that. And we tried everything we could. <clears throat> I had the funniest thing happen. I was. I, uh, I, 
I've, I've worked with virtually all the governors since day one. <clears throat> and I was at the governor's mansion when, when Governor Romer was governor. And I found myself sitting next to the head of RTD and the head of the highway department. And I knew them both. And I, this just kind of came to me. And I, I made this up, literally made it up. I said, you know, to the RTD guy, I said, you're, you're, we're building all these park and rides and, and people get confused. I made it up. People get confused. They don't know where they are. Uh, wouldn't it be great if you identified the park and ride and gave it a name, like Highlands Ranch, wouldn't that be it? And he said, you know, Joe, that's probably a good idea because it's a new area and we, we'll do that. And then I, literally, this was a 20 minute conversation. And I said to the highway, head of the highway department, now look, they're gonna put this sign that says uh, Highlands Ranch Park and Ride we need a sign up on the road that says Highlands Ranch. Get off exit. the university. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I, I, and I remember when they came out and put the sign up, I took my family out on the, on the north side of C-470, of, 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 of C-470, to point out what was, what was happening there. It was, it was such a joy. And, it, we, and I finally got the dead gun thing done. By the way, did you ever live in Highlands Ranch, or did you suffer from this commute for years and years? And I, I endured. Particularly prior to C-470 being built. I did indeed. I yeah. did indeed. Um, well, and you were I, for punishment to do this for almost 20 years. I, it, was, it was unbelievable. I, I, I did. And, and there was never any criticism from the company, you know, why don't you live in Highlands Ranch? Um, I liked the ability to say I'm done and not. And just kind of get. We well, have a going. lot of roots in Park Hill. I, too. I do. That was and your parents lived there before you. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. It, it was. I, it was. I there. get that. But I tell you what I did. That was that was life changing. Um, I started doing books on tape, and I would go to the old Highlands Ranch library, and I do. You were a trustee, were you not? I was at, that, the uh, one that was at the convenience center. Yes, that's right. Yeah. And, but I'm a Civil War nut, and I would I would be doing Civil War, and then I got into and so the the commute was not so bad, you know. I it was it was 40 minutes one way. It didn't matter. You're going to get it, and it was all it was all fair. Sure. But but you know, getting to getting the name Highlands Ranch, we talk about that. Um, you, you, it's all accepted now. I mean, it's it's all accepted. But you really have to peel some of this back to say, well, where, where is it, you know? Because when we started, we were in the Littleton uh, postal zone. We were in 80126, Littleton, Colorado. And Jack Sauer was the wonderful young postmaster in Littleton. And I went over to say, Jack, I, we, we really need, you know, we're trying to make this hometown USA we really need to say Highlands Ranch. He said, oh, you can't do that, Joe. You, you know, there, there is no place. You're not official. And so I said, all right. So, uh, Jack, let me ask you a question. <clears throat> when you sort mail, do you sort by Littleton, Colorado, or do you sort by zip code? Oh, we said we sort by zip code. I said, here's an idea. Why don't we just say Highlands Ranch, Colorado, 80126? You, you, you don't care, do you? No, we really. And I'll, but he said, if I do that, will you do, will you do gang um, uh, postal delivery? We don't want to have to do delivery to all your dadgum homes out there. My words, not his. So that's, I said, you need that? That makes total sense to me. We need Highlands Ranch, 80126. We got a deal. So that's how... Highlands Ranch got started in the postal zone. And this is prior to the post office at Quebec and it, it, I was just going to say that the first time the first time the name Highlands Ranch Colorado ever appeared was at that post office down the way on Quebec which ultimately became multiple zip codes. Correct. But later on <laughs> but we're still now recognized yeah. as Highlands Ranch. So we did everything we could to get the name Highlands Ranch involved. You know, getting getting the first high school named Highlands Ranch here was uh, not the easiest thing in the world. 
but it uh, it honored our history and it honored and this and, and working with the Douglas County School District uh, was fun getting that done as well. Yeah, Kathy Brock had uh, had mentioned. Uh, no, I left. I lost my train of thought on that. Never mind. I'll edit that out. <laughs> That's all right. That's true. Uh, what shall I ask you? Oh yeah. Kathy Brock had shown me some of the initial material that was used to not only justify um, this purchase to Phil Morris, but also to use in marketing uh, the homes and the developments that were going to be built. Right. And it was called the New Town of Highlands Ranch. Eventually, that got shortened to just right. Highlands Ranch. Right. But uh, our cook was brought out from California. And in addition to being the ranch manager, um, where they were running up to 800 head of cattle, or whatever, and buying and selling at the brush. That's uh, correct. Market at this point. He enjoyed that part, but he was also the community spokesman. Because right. Because he had done similar things in California. Yes. Um, did you two ever overlap in terms oh, we of responsibility? Worked, we worked together. Uh, Art was had the, the golden voice. Uh, Art Art Cook was just the best. His wife was the postmistress. First postmistress. Yes, postmistress. Mistress. Yes. The one at the convenience. Center. Yes, right. Actually, and and uh, that was Pat. we worked out. We worked Pat. Pat. Yeah. It, it, the initial one was a little trailer. Now at Dad Clark on the north side of Dad Clark and and east of uh, east of Broadway. Delightful couple. He was a delight. He loved the ranching side. Yes, we had at the time the largest, that's forgotten, we had the largest cow-calf operation in Douglas County at the time. And my understanding that there were tax advantages. Of course. I mean, we, but the undeveloped land at that point as part of the 40-year plan was, 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 was all agriculturally was taxed. Was all agriculturally taxed. Yeah. Exactly right. And, and, and appropriately as the... As the as the uses changed, it it became, uh, became either residential. residential or commercial yeah. or or non-urban. And then when they get a tap uses. fee, then they That's, collected the system development fee to the, fund the infrastructure. The infrastructure that was needed. Yeah. But but you couldn't have found a better spokesperson for for Highlands Ranch than Art. Art. Oh my God! I we'd have Highlands Ranch days. You know when that when we first opened uh, that. December of 1981, uh, Jeff Kappas was, uh, I always kid him still about being a little elf. He was uh, announcing that he was coming down, uh, Dad Clark on his way to uh, bring Christmas joy to the to the kids in Highlands Ranch. And this and, was at Santa's workshop? Yes. And he, you know, the story is that they called up to California, to Mission Viejo, uh, and said, send us the plans for the physical building and yes. we'll build one ourselves out here. Yeah. Oh, I mean, and, and, and at, at, uh, at the uh, branding uh, time, uh, we would have the whole community out for a big community uh, picnic. I mean, it was a big deal for three or four years. You'd have, well, the initial, you might have had 50 people, then you had 400 people, then you had maybe 1,000, and then, you know, that's one thing that you learned in this. Um, and, and that is that you had to retell the story all the time because you had people moving in who were not aware of what the promises were of what, of what, what we are trying to accomplish. And so our communication with our own constituents was a really important aspect of why we were so successful. I saw several pictures that occurred at the Highlands Ranch Mansion, which was definitely a community-oriented activity. Yes. yes. Our cook was known for his pit barbecues That's right. in the backyard. That's exactly right. And I even saw at one point um, a swimming pool. Yes. That's a slide. That's right. Was that in, which now is on the outside of the metal fence. That's right. Was that an in-ground pool, from what you recall? Yes, I think I so. I think it was. Yeah, I think so. The photos that I've seen. Yeah. And some place <laughs> later on, that kind of disappeared. But right. You know, you, 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 I, thank you for bringing that up because the way in which Mission and those early plans um, 
celebrated the history of, of Highlands Ranch. That mansion, everything south, you know, that's left open. That's left open. Uh, the, the, the windmill, the, the stone windmill, the open sense that it, it's, it's some of the most beautiful area and the most beautiful area in Highlands Ranch was part of the, of the uh, conservation easement. I'll tell you a story. It's about 8,500 acres. I heard this from Kathy, <coughs> who was at the luncheon, so it's probably accurate. So 1979, probably. <clears throat> so they go down to Cherokee Ranch, Tweet Kimball's place. And Tweet's kind of the big dog on the Planning Commission at that point. And Phil Riley's there, and Jim Teffer, and Kathy, and whoever else. And they get to discussing the plan because the Planning Commission for Douglas County is going to have to approve it before it goes to the County Commissioner. And Phil kind of asks Tweet, saying, Tweet, what's it going to take to get our project approved? Because there was lots of concern of this big urban, suburban development going into a rural county. Right. Well, so Tweet says, when I look north from up in my castle, I never want to see another house that's built. Yeah. So Phil Riley, seizing an opportunity, says, tell you what, you take a certain number of acres on the north side of your property down to the, the borderline there of the Douglas Pasture. Right. And we'll take seven or 8,000 acres yep. on the south side of our property, and we promise that we will never build on that. And there's a ridge up there, and when eventually we build homes, you will never see them because they'll be on the other side, on the north side right. of the ridge, and you'll never see them. And Tweet said, sounds acceptable, deal. Now, how truthful that is, there's probably more well, to it than I that. Katie Bowen was I on the planning not, commission as well. I would not doubt it. But um, she was there. She, so yes, oh no. And, and, I assume it's credible. And uh, Elizabeth and I were great, great, great friends of Tweet. Oh, my gracious. Uh, Elizabeth being from South Carolina and, and Tweet being from Tennessee. Sure. Uh, they, I mean, they bonded. Chattanooga. They, Chattanooga, yeah. they bonded. But, but that's how these guys operated. And then that was all put together in a very... Uh, specific series of promises written down that that right. ground will always be left open yeah and and think about that i mean is that when, when you combine uh, the open space the conservation open space easement that that emission provided and shay has of course done i will come back and talk about i have such regard for shay but you combine that with the fact that the city and county of denver has douglas uh, has uh, Daniel's Park, uh, Daniel's Park. Yeah. and then what what you've got with regard to Tweets Cherokee Ranch and Castle Foundation. I mean, it, uh, some real visionaries have been at work here in the last fifty years. That people need to say, wait a minute, that's that's pretty interesting mm -hmm. because the first, I believe, the first territorial road before we were a state. Uh, it, it went down Santa Fe, and then the other one went down before, what is now... No, before Santa Fe. It went down Colorado it went, Boulevard. What was Colorado Boulevard. It and went then, up over <clears throat> to Daniels Park. Daniels Park and came down through P Pretty Woman Ranch, which 1861, is... 1861, 1863. There we are. Elizabeth and, and Sylvester Richardson. Okay. Well, the Pretty ran Pretty... Pretty Woman Ranch, if you know where to look, there's this old stagecoach there. And those two, <clears throat> those two log cabins are still there. Still there. Eventually, the railroads pushed through on Santa Fe, and then the Territory Road, road moved over to Santa Fe. Right. And down through Sedalia and all those towns that are long forgotten. Down, down, down the way. That's exactly yeah. right. Um, it, 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 it's remarkable, uh, again, how that, how that worked. Um, you know, you, you remind me, uh, when we wanted to bring a road in from the, from the west to the east uh, and, and not come in Ranch Road, mm -hmm. uh, the neighbors were very upset. Oh, you know, you, you, how can you do that? Uh, and I remember, gosh, I, uh, 
Bob McQuarrie was the name of a wonderful man, uh, ran the, uh, the Littleton Historical Museum. What a phenomenal facility that is, and he is now deceased. What a fabulous man. And he and I worked together to say, well, wait a minute, what was the original, where did, was, uh, did, did the original access come in from Highlands Ranch? Well, it came in off of Santa Fe. <clears throat> so we were able to show that it was historically accurate our approach. Now, it took a lot of time and effort to go through the history of how we made that happen, but it, it did. And that's part of the reason why there is gates at the Highlands Ranch Mansion today to avoid the people who want to use it as a shortcut to that's, drive through. That's exactly. Ranch Road to Gateway. And we went through all of those, yeah. you know, and again, all with very specific undertakings. With well, the, the mansions had <clears throat> lots of interesting discussion. At one point, Jim Tepper told me that they thought of <clears throat> actually turning it into kind of an administrative building. At one point, we thought that what ultimately in the 2000s became Southridge Rec Center was one of the possible sites was right. on the historic ranch there at the mansion, and there was some pushback about that. Pushback, but also some discussion at times about making it an inn. I have I have a uh, a kind of a personal story about that because um, uh, it's 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 it was deeply touching. Now funny, but touching. So uh, th there was a the first freestanding hospice here uh, was being discussed, and the man who was running it was Father Paul von Lobkowitz who was a charismatic guy, a really wonderful guy, who had befriended a couple that I knew, and his wife was my wife's dearest friend. And Father Paul got it in his mind that he wanted to have the Highlands Ranch Mansion for a hospice. And he called Art Cook, and Art said, hey, you know, we're not going to deal with it. Well, uh, Father Paul was a very... Uh, he would not, he was a persistent fellow. So I said, not to worry, Art, not to worry. I'll, I'll take care of this boy. I'll, I'll meet with a guy. I don't know him. I know Tanny and her mother and we'll meet and I'll, I'll get that done. So I meet with him and uh, said, Paul, we, 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 you're not going to get that. That's just not going to happen. But what can I do to help? Well, I end up becoming the president of the dadgum hospice and helping him find another location. Another location. Yeah. That's good. <laughs> yeah. That, so that was the hospice of St. John. Yep. Now it's no longer in existence, but uh, that's how that got to be out in, yep. in Lakewood. Most interesting. Yeah. You got invited back when the mansion got transferred from um, Shea Homes at that time to, right. uh, to the Metro District. But early memories of the 80s of the mansion, did you have much to do with that? Uh, I tell you, it was, it was so much fun. It was such a joy to, uh, to be able to go there. It, and it, they did parties there, and we had, we had great, great times. Uh, my my, uh, uh, my parents we had their 60th anniversary out there and came from Park Hill in a London bus. And then I, uh, and, and the Shea people were so kind and uh, allowed us to do this. We had my dad's 100th birthday out there. And uh, it, was, it, wow. it was just, it was remarkable. So there's longevity in your family. There, there is, there, 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 there is. And one of, the great, one of the great memories also was for Tweet's 80th birthday. Art Cook was the MC. He was, and uh, we had worked out this deal where I, uh, it was so adorable. Uh, I said, Tweet, I'm gonna come, I'm a little surprised for you. Uh, I want you to be ready at at this hour. I think it was at 11:30 a.m. But I have a little surprise, and uh, and I, and she's just like a debutante, a young. Oh, what's it going to be, and what are you doing, and all of this. 
Well, I had. She bought a hat too. Uh, she bought a hat, and and um, she, I, 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 I was in a helicopter. Uh, mm -hmm. Richard Gooding provided a helicopter, so we, we. Uh, Were you in the helicopter? I was in the helicopter. Yeah. So I went. We flew up from from the mansion, our mansion, down and landed in front of Tweed's castle. She, you know, she's just beside herself. And then we fly her back down and land out on the west side of the uh, of the mansion. And we have this. So all of her Sweetbriar classmates are there. All of the hounds from uh, from the Arapaho hunt are there. Sure, Marv is there. Our, our cook is doing the. We have a little parade in front of the mansion. And they had a carriage. To oh, we had a carriage. She had to have a carriage. To yeah. the mansion steps. I, my hands were a little shaky when I tried to put the corsage on. I will yeah. say that. I needed a little help on that one. Yeah. But it was so much fun. So Mansion has great memories. A Waterloo event. A Waterloo event. I was just, my daughter and I were just in January, February uh, at the uh, castle. Uh, by the way, the uh, foundation, the, the, the uh, uh, foundation that's, that's supporting that uh, facility of hers, the, the castles never looked as good. They are doing a magnificent job. And it was for Tweed's, quote, 105th uh, birthday. Yeah, yeah, I think James Holmes is doing wonderful things. He is absolutely, just absolutely, he's doing yeah. a great job. And, and they, um, they, they should be supported. They're doing, they're doing phenomenal work here. So the 2009 event that you were invited <clears throat> back when Shea pretty much was giving the mansion yes. to the Metro District. Marianne Morgan was still alive at that point. She was. Do you want to share any memories you had of Mar Marianne? Uh, Marianne was uh, phenomenal because Marianne had grown up here and lived in a house just uh, on the on the north side of Highlands Ranch, a, a little nondescript house, but again, pointing to the humanity and, and the character of Mission Viejo people and the Shea people. They said, Marion, you've been here forever. We're not going to move you at all. You're going to stay exactly where you are. And and they did that. And so, of course, this was for her to be there and still that's, you know, she I mean, finally passed on. But um, but it was she lived there, I, I'll bet, for 25, 20 years anyway. But it was it was perfect. And. And 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 uh, Marvin Beeman. I mean that they've always they've always uh, responded well to the uh, to the history and the sensitivity of this place. Mm -hmm. That they have. And and I, I I've got to say uh, I think it was 1995 is when they uh, um, sold uh, uh, Philip Morris. I always laughed that we that Mission couldn't produce enough zeros because you know that we we. We we were always profitable, always profitable, but you need lots and lots of zeros in a in a big corporation like that. Cannot praise the management of Philip Morris any higher than than. But. So at around that timetable, 1995, 1996, yes. they decided that they would sell sell all of those properties, including the properties in California and Arizona. Uh, yes, as well as here in Colorado. Here in Colorado, Colorado. yeah. And so they started looking, and fortunately, Shea uh, came and, and acquired us. And again, the quality, the, the, the thoughtfulness, the character, the history, I mean, you were just proud. And I was so honored to stay on with them <clears throat> because I had such high regard. I asked Terry Nolan, I said, what was the effect on your paycheck? Uh, well, not your paycheck, but Metro District that now Shea you worked with instead of Mission Viejo, and he said there was no change. No. Your paycheck changed. Yep. Where you weren't a Mission Viejo employee anymore, you were a Shea employee. Correct. And it was... At it least was, for another two or three years. It was seamless. It was absolutely seamless. You know, I want to tell you a story about Terry. So uh, I cannot give you the specific year he started. At the, 1996. So, okay, so 1996, uh, Terry was fresh out of being a naval pilot. Um, he read in maybe our local newspaper 
that there was a vacancy at the uh, as a, as the manager of the HRCA. You know, Terry had grown up here, went to the University of Colorado Boulder. That's right. For his undergraduate. I'd forgotten that. That's so he got his master's degree in finance or something while he was in, in, the, in, Navy in the Navy in California. In California. Yeah. <clears throat> well, um, he he came to see me um, because I was on the HRCA board and and um, and he had you know this great military record and I said. Terry, I think we just filled that. I don't think there's that position is still open. Uh, we do have a position open uh, with the metro districts. And he said, well, I might, that might be very interesting for me. And I said, well, you know, let's, let's talk about that because you're not. You, you have know, no for, government background. You have no that. government background. You're a military background. But, but, but he had management background. You have, you have an extraordinary background. And... Um, so we talked. We talked for probably a couple of hours. And I said, you know, uh, just hang in there. Just hang in there. Let me see what I can do. So we had uh, four other members of the board. Well, we had, we, had, we had more than that who were going to make the decision. I believe the majority were non-mission people. They were resident board members. Of the of the associate of the uh, of the metro districts, and I went to each of them and I said, "Now look, I I I want you to do me a favor. Um, I've got a guy with military background, uh, non traditional. Oh, Joe, that would never that would never work." No, I said, "Just just no, but that will." I said, "No, just do me a favor. Just I just want you to interview him. I want you to talk to him, and leave all your preconceptions aside and just." See what you see, and I think you'll have a, a a better understanding of the character of this guy. And they did, and yeah, and that's what happened. And 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 he's been remarkable. You know, he would he would write every oh God, did he write a report every Friday to the board? I mean, he his his communication skills and. And he was always he was always optimistic. He would end that. Well, that's his phrase. phrase yeah. Is about optimistic. He told a story that at one point the uh, Douglas County government came through with a requirement, unfunded, that for commercial properties that sidewalks needed to be shoveled if it was three inches of snow or more a year. And he was grumbling about that because there was a requirement, there was no funding for it, but he said that he talked to you and that you said, Terry, you're missing an opportunity here. No other community does this. You can use this as a marketing advantage. Yeah. And you'll find the funds to do this, and it'll be a competitive advantage. And that's what you told him. <laughs> true story? Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. Devious. I'm a devious man. Okay, Joe, among other things, when the infrastructure <laughs> was being developed in the early 80s for this new community, transportation always comes up as an issue is the transportation highways that are being built can be satisfactory to support the different zoning portions as part of the plan, and also the whole issue of public transportation. Did you have any involvement in helping shape what became in the transportation plan? Thank you for asking that. Um, in the initial plan unit development guide, the there were a couple of um, uh, uh, of elements that that mission in planning this wanted to be sure that internally, uh, because people were going to live and work here, that they would not be a burden in terms of of going outside the community if they if they were going to be able to work. So they wanted to build uh, on the highway side, on the road side at at maximum, and we've talked about that. <clears throat> they also had a, a, an idea of doing. <clears throat> a, a um, an internal transit uh, system where they would have buses moving from place to place to try to reduce traffic. Um, but it was funny because Highlands Ranch was not part of the regional transportation district. Uh, it had been originally, uh, but they had taken the property owners and everybody else and particularly portions of Parker and Castle Rock had taken themselves out of, of RTD. 
And I had uh, two great friends who were in the General Assembly, um, one of whom is now deceased, who had been in the FBI, was in law school with me, and a great leader in the General Assembly, and uh, a, a lady who had worked with me when I was Denver County Republican chairman, and then in her own right served in the legislature and in Denver City Council. But at this time, she's in the legislature, and Elizabeth and I, had, uh, we knew them both socially. Uh, they were not married, but we drove them up to, uh, one evening, we drove them up to Daniels Park. It was a beautiful evening, and they're having such a great time. And they, in, in one of those little innocent moments, they say, now, Joe, is there anything we could, is there anything you need? What, what, could you, what could you want, Joe? Is there anything you want? I say, you know, there is something. I, 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 I want to get Highlands Ranch in the regional transportation district. Oh, they said, well, let's see what we can do. You know they've took it about. There's a little bit of antagonism around others who've been paying in their, this uh, fee, uh, this sales tax. But Is that a half a percent or whatever? It was a, maybe, that's, that's exactly right. Yeah. So we, we dreamt up this whole thing, and, um, and we got Highlands Ranch by meets and bounds uh, annexed in, back into the R RTD. And it, I, I, one of my great photographs somewhere in the house, I, we all have photographs we wish we could find, was the first bus that came in at the, there at the town center. Uh, with the zero, uh, which was the the, the Broadway. number, the Broadway, and uh, thank you, that's exactly right. Mm -hmm. And ironically, ironically, so that 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 relieved mission of a lot of um, mm -hmm. uh, of a lot of uh, pain and suffering and investment that we we got the RTD. People always to, say that you know things happen from people who know each other. They do, and and and, and who know and trust each other. Yeah. But it's so funny because my office today as Chancellor Emeritus is down on 17th and Glenarm. And I've got a corner office and I look out and every day here comes the Highlands Ranch Zero bus yeah. passing by it. it just, it's, yeah. a, it's a sense of joy. It's great. One of the other things I understand you might have been involved in was when the Douglas County Sheriff uh, was concerned that having a firing range to train his deputies over by the Douglas County Fairgrounds was not optimum. And so I understand there was <clears throat> a request that Steve Zotos, the sheriff, asked the Mission Viejo people, whether it was Jim Teffer or others like you, to say, would there be a possibility of having a, a range somewhere else out in the Highlands Ranch area? Tell me about your involvement, if you had any. Well, I, I did, and, and uh, typical of Jim Tepfer, he generous and thoughtful and responsive uh, to that. Um, you know, when Mission came here, they didn't want to be a, uh, an imp imposition on the sheriff, and they bought, or they, they bought a, a vehicle for, the, for yeah, them a car. and a car for them. But uh, out of that... Uh, idea was created the Highlands Ranch Law Enforcement Training Training Facility, and uh, it was a 501c3. And the sheriff of Douglas County, Steve Zotos, and the sheriff of Arapahoe County, and myself served as the board of governors, board of directors for that. And it became more and more and more useful, essential, um, not just, a, initially it was a firing range, yes, that's right, but I remember they also used it for, um, pigs decompose at the same rate as humans, I'm told, and they uh, have it, had an area then where they would bury uh, pigs and, and, and train dogs and others to try to find those those carcasses, if you will, so that was uh, that was an adjunct, and then they added others, and then they added a facility, and my old boss in the FBI had come out in the meantime to to head up the Colorado Sheriffs Association, 
Jim O'Neill, and he um, helped us get a design for this thing. And we raised money to, to, to make it happen. Um, today, it's one of the finest <clears throat> training facilities around used People by come from all over the world all over the world the, the bureau the FBI uses it uh, when they when they're here if they need it it's it's a remark it's a remarkable thing and uh, I always laughed at at, at, at at Steve Zotis who's a great man and a great friend that whenever we sort of needed to have plumbing done or we needed to have a little carpentry work done that that the arrest records, uh, the the, re the arrest uh, results in that area would find that we'd get more prisoners all of a sudden in plumbing and more prisoners out of the construction mm -hmm. trades, so that we could get things done at a interesting. At a, at an interesting That's way. good. Yeah, that was dedicated in 1987, <clears throat> yeah. I believe. Yeah. At that point, and you're right, it's expanded a lot. Yes. Well, your role expanded a lot too. After 1999, you decided to leave. Shea, who had bought Mission Viejo, what yes. prompted your decision? You know, it's another one of those with when I mentioned Jim Nicholson mm -hmm. uh, having me uh, come here or giving me the introduction here. A very, very, very dear friend, uh, Doug Jones, who's still a dear, dear, dear friend, and he he he's uh, with a realty company. Yes, and uh, you know, we all have angels in our lives. He's one of my angels, and. Um, I'll come back and tell more about that. But he was coming in as the president, uh, excuse me, as the chairman of the uh, Denver Metro Chamber of Commerce. I was, I'd been on the board. Um, the man who was the then president had decided he was going to leave. So there, there was a vacancy. And, um, and Doug and others said, Joe, you really need to take this on. And I, I initially two or three times, two times said no. And then I remember Elizabeth, my wife, saying, tell me again, what, what, what are they talking to you about? And I said, she said, I can't imagine. You're kind of like home boy, hometown boy comes home. You, you really need to do that. So uh, Bert Selva was the president here of, of Shea. Of Shea. Mm -hmm. I cannot say enough good things about that young man. He, he is remarkable. And, and, and uh, oh my gracious, the way he operated and the, and the team he put together, Cheddar Latcham. I mean, you're dealing with the finest people in the, in the, in the business. But I, I sat down and he said, Joe, you know, I, we have kind of an agreement with you that you'll stay with us. And I said, well, I'd really, Bird, if we can, we met on a Sunday. Uh, but you'd been here 20 years. Yeah, but I'd just been with him since. Shea, my, only two or three. Yeah, four. It's, I think I had a five-year contract. And he said, well, look, I, I'll, I'll let you do it. Uh, go, you know, go with my blessing because it, it's going to be fun for you. So I, I went down to the Denver Metro Chamber and was there for 10 years had the time of my life. Um, we had the best, we had the best people. We, uh, we could do anything. And, and these, the people who worked there, it was, it was phenomenal. We, we all, none of us worked there. We all, we all had a great time. I had, I had two, two rules, uh, respect, yeah, respect. You got to respect, uh, our members and got to respect yourself. You got to respect everybody we work with. And, an attitude. You can't, you can't live in this time and in this place and not have the best. And those are the only two rules. Those are the only two. You, any, you can do anything else you want. You'll, you, you'll, you'll, you'll never get in trouble. Just, you know, initiate anything you want to do. And they were, we were, had more fun. Best board of uh, directors at 55. And we got more accomplished. I mean, it was 55 just, on your board. Yes, oh, it's it was, a big board. It was a big board. It was yeah. a big board. But I, I made it clear that that at our all of our board meetings were open to staff. Uh, there are no secrets. You know, I want to be sure that that staff know you, member of the board, um, and and there are no limits on who can talk to who, um, and the respect. I mean, if you want you want respect, we had. 
we had respect that was uh, that was unbelievable and and accomplished amazing things. Primary purpose of the Metro Chamber of Commerce was to support the existing businesses and grow in yes bring in new businesses bring in new businesses and also. We were going through some major, talk about infrastructure, we were going through some major infrastructure, regional infrastructure issues. Uh, I-70, I-25. Denver, Inter the, Denver International Airport, yeah. led by the Denver Metro Chamber. Uh, you, you had the, the first, first successful fast tracks that came, became fast tracks that required a vote. You had uh, the trans bonding that, that, that opened I-25, that because it was a multi-year obligation under Tabor, had to be voted upon and approved, done contemporaneously with, uh, with everybody. We had, uh, we had baseball that, that came about. Um, I think we had about $10 billion. We had, we had uh, um, Fitzsimmons that was being transformed mm -hmm. into what is now one of the finest, the Anschutz campus, of course, doing magnificent work with CU and other uh, entities. I mean, we had about $10 billion of publicly approved investments uh, in about 10 years. So, and, and, and key in that undertaking uh, was the Denver Metro Chamber. I know they, they at times are, are, you know, you never saw a tax you didn't, didn't adopt or approve of. We took some we didn't, we didn't approve of we, that said, no, that, that's not one we want to get involved with. But uh, transportation was clearly it. I, I ended up, uh, uh, before I went to the chamber, I had been appointed by uh, Governor Owens uh, to the state uh Transportation Commission and was chairing it, uh, that Transportation Commission. Um, it, so it, we were key and it was a great time. And, you know, we've talked about referendum C and D. Referendum C and D were a statewide vote uh, that um, uh, in 1995, C passed, D did not. And what C did it's, it's the only, I'm very proud of this, it's the only statewide uh, uh, measure that, that dealt with citizens saying, we will take a time out on Tabor for five years. We won't get our refunds. We'll allow the state to take those increased revenues that are coming in for transportation, for health care, and for education. Uh, all good causes. All good causes, but it had to be approved on a statewide basis, statewide vote. Um, Bruce Benson was a co-chair. Uh, Al Yates was a co-chair and myself and traveled all over the state. Hunt, thousands of organizations approving it. Those who, uh, I mean, it, 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 it is consistent with Tabor in the sense that Taxpayers Bill of Rights that says you cannot without approval of, 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 the, of the voters in a taxing element. You cannot adopt something that deals with, with uh, finances without approval of the people and, and Tabor said without approval of the people. So under, under Ref C, we were following what Tabor said. If the people say, we'll stop, uh, we will not accept our potential Tabor refund over a five year period, you can reinvest it here and it was adopted by, after all we went through, maybe 50.2%. It was very close, 51%. D failed. D, D was a designated fund for, uh, for highway construction. But uh, it's still the landmark. It's still the um, paradigm for, for how, on a statewide basis, that got done. And it was, it was so much fun, I can't tell you. It's good. Then well, I, I mentioned you... I mentioned Doug Jones and and the last so Doug uh, is appointed by Governor Romer Governor Owens to uh, to be on the board of governors of Colorado State University and uh, he and I 
our very, very close friends at that time, as well as now. And uh, I remember he invited me up to drive up with him to hear Gorbachev speak at CSU. And on the way up, we got reminiscing about how much fun it had been for both of us to work together at the chamber, he as chair and me as president. And I said, wouldn't it be fun if we could do something together again? And he said, well, let's, why don't you think about uh, coming on the board of, of uh, governors of CSU? And uh, long story short, um, <laughs> they, they, uh, Governor Owens um, appointed me, you have to be approved by the state senate. And I can remember the delightful uh, senator, a um, uh, uh, lady who sa- was chair of the, of the Senate Education Commission, said, we're not taking any more white guys. We're not taking <laughs> any more white guys. We've had all of them we're going to have, but we'll take you <laughs> because of what you did on Ref C. There, there was a little bit of pushback <laughs> about you being the only senior, or the only finalist. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, no, that then becomes... So then, then uh, I, so I joined that board, I don't know, 2006, 2005. And then in 2009, yeah. about right now, uh, they had decided that they were going to split out because in, in historically, the president was also the chancellor of CSU and they decided we're going to do something with regard to uh, a, a standalone system as, such as CU has. So that's when I then uh, became the sole finalist for that for that job, and was Where you had responsibilities for three, Pueblo, as Pueblo well as, and as well as as well as the uh, online our CSU yeah. Global, which grew quite a bit, amazingly. Over it is the a, a years that you've been involved in that. Yes, that's right. So I stayed on. I became chancellor and had a great time with that. Got got the global going and said. This is fine, guys. I've enjoyed this. I don't need any more. They said, stay on. You get to keep your Denver office? You get to keep your Denver office. I live in Park Hill. I'm five minutes from my office, and I, uh, I get to raise money for them. And I, lo- I didn't go to CSU, but I love CSU. I love its uh, character and its quality. So thanks. Wonderful. Thanks, guys. We'll give you the last word. We're approaching uh, mm-hmm. our time constraint here. Uh, we wanted to thank you on behalf of the Historical Society for well, coming and sharing your memories of your time in the first 20 years and the development you. of this community. You know, I want to thank you guys because um, as someone who grew up in Denver in the, and, and saw this, this impending doom called Development of Islands Ranch by a California developer. Uh, I didn't know him. I had the same reaction that everybody else would have had. Um, And then to have been given the chance at that time and place to be a part of this. uh, I I was sort of every man in the sense that I didn't have the expertise that others had and, and could really call upon him. But I also had the sense of wonder that I never lost uh, for this. And, and for you all to take the time to, to really build the legend that, that it was, because you, you, you can't reach back and smell it, and you can't reach back and see those, the, the fact that County Line Road was, was not paved, it was, it was a series of bumps, and uh, that, that, to see that the landfill caught on fire, but to know the characters, to know the Tweed Kimballs, to know the Doc Duncans and the Bill Duncans, to know these people and to see them in those innocent days of, uh, of, of vision and resolve was really, was really remarkable. I had a, a friend I made here. I don't know if you ever knew Clyde Jones. He's Did not. deceased. He, he and I became great friends. Uh, he had moved here from uh, Oklahoma and became sort of the unofficial historian of Douglas County. Mm-hmm. And he would, the two of us would travel all over Douglas County and he'd show me these places that he had, he had found Lamb Springs and other places that are just remarkable. And, and so I have a great sense of appreciation uh, for history. I'm a, well, that is uh, our, that's part of our history. That's here. right. 
So, so thank all you. all the other wrenches. So I want to thank you guys. Well, thank you. You bet.